Good evening, everyone, um, and uh, thanks so much for coming to discuss what is perhaps our most pressing social question attached to the economy at the moment, namely how we can, in the title of the, uh, the new Prospect Roundtree report, which I hope you've all been given, um, make jobs work. Um, in some senses, Britain's labour market right now might seem like the most stunning success story. Just a few months into the great unlock, unemployment is not much higher than it was before the COVID hit in the first place. Um, it's far, far lower than anyone would have dared to expect at this stage of the game. So, you know, we've got a triumph here when it comes to this question of the quantity of jobs. But all kinds of strain and worry emerges the minute you move from the quantity to the quality. And that really is what we're going to be talking about today. Now, some aspects of this question of the quality of jobs, there's a new and welcome political consensus. Namely, everyone agrees, even Boris Johnson, that um, the wages are too low and now need to rise. And indeed, the government is pushing up the minimum wage. And interestingly, on a day when inflation's just at its highest level for 10 years, Boris Johnson, if not all of his government, are also cheering on wage rises more generally. But just as important as how much people are paid in a given week is how much confidence they can have that the same amount of wage is going to be available next week. Moreover, for millions of British workers, the fabled flexibility of the labour market runs only in one direction, which is directly against them. And that's because the corollary of unreliable shifts is the reality of being forced to uh, accept whatever disruptive or an, uh, anti-social hours might be available to you and uh, take those kind of hours at short notice, which is where it really starts to impact on family life and uh, all the rest of it. Now, this cluster of problems that we're talking about here have become notorious in the context of the gig economy. So things like Uber drivers and the delivery riders, and we covered them in some detail in Prospect, but when Roundtree and uh, myself were first sort of kicking around, what should we, you know, should we focus on that? So no, because the thing is, lots of these problems go much more widely across the economy. The gig economy is maybe an intense example of it, but um, uh, some really big industries are much affected by the same thing. And one very, very big industry that, um, given the demographics of this country, is only going to get bigger is um, social care uh, and uh, what we found out as we and Madeline I'll say more about in a moment dug into this is that um, actually in social care you saw that process of labour being turned off and on like a tap in a way that we're used to if we're talking about delivery or task rabbit or whatever it may be but in like these kind of huge um, uh, service sector um, industries that employ millions of people. Um, uh, so we're going to focus on um, that issue initially of social care and then we'll come back and um, uh, talk about um, what is happening across the broader economy including hospitality, warehousing and even education. And social care is an interesting one because um, the headlines of late um, you might have thought sounded quite encouraging with Boris Johnson's new settlement uh, for care announced back in September. Um, the kind of controversial tax rise associated with it ramming through Parliament just a day or two um, later. Um, and it sounds like something big and interesting is happening and changing in social care. And in some ways it is. But it turns out that this is much more about how society splits the bills of social care and the heritability of middle class homes than um, anything else. So I hope our discussion can redress that balance um, as well as um, opening a window into like what, if anything, is going to change for the workers at the front end of um, the social care question. So without further ado, let me um, welcome our excellent panel here. Um, we've got um, Madeline Bunting, who's a distinguished writer at The Guardian for many years. Uh, these days has a foot in academia too. Is a visiting professor, I think, at the LSE's International Inequalities Institute, but also the author of many books, including most pertinently for what we're talking about here, Labours of Love, The Crisis of Care, which came out last year. Next, we have Hazel Radcliffe, 
Ratcliffe, who worked for many years in care herself, um, and although she's more recently moved into something else, into sales, she has years of experience of exactly the issues that we're talking about, of struggling to maintain a suitable work-life balance with the long hours, the low pay, and the family life, and all the rest of it. And as we'll hear, Hazel is now using this experience to work with the Roundtree Foundation to develop ideas about how to make jobs work. And then third, um, and finally, um, I'm pleased to welcome um, Katie Schmoker from the Joseph Browntree Foundation, who's the master of all the evidence about British jobs as they stand, and a font of ideas about how public, public policy could make them um, better. I should briefly just say too, um, for anyone who doesn't know, Tom Clark, um, and I'm now proud to call Katie a colleague, because I've somewhere between editing this report uh, and um, uh, and tonight um, kind of moved out of the editor's chair at Prospect, which Alan over there has now moved into. I'm still doing some stuff at the magazine, but I'm also um, now a fellow at the, at the Roundtree um, Foundation. Um, but, um, and we're going to have um, a couple of the people who Madeline writes about in her excellent essay uh, drop by a bit later. And we're also expecting some um, politicians, hopefully Labour's Angela Rain is going to be here a bit later as well, but um, Keir Starmer wanted her for something or other before um, before we get to that. So Madeline, um, uh, you wrote the lead piece and you spoke to several care workers, a couple of whom we hope we'll see in a minute. Um, can you just say a, word, a few words, it's a few months since you did all that reporting about what you distilled from that investigation? Sure. Um it was uh, a very, very interesting thing to go back in the summer at Tom's request um, to um, the form of research that I'd been doing a lot of since 2015. I had been, um, for my book, going around the country, all over uh, different parts of the country, asking people whose work was involved in care what they understood the word to mean. And it was that was the sort of keyhole, if you like, into th trying to think more and more deeply about the place that care has in our society, about our understandings of it, about why it's locked into a set of problems around low pay and low status. And uh, there's always this process whereby you put a book to bed and then you have lots of other brilliant ideas which it's too late to put in the book. So um, uh, I found it absolutely fascinating to talk to Susie and Gilda um, amongst several other care workers I talked to and I hope Susie's going to arrive at some point. Um, and it, it led to a series of reflections, and I just want to um, clarify some of those. Um, we all know the sort of four problems that bedevil this form of work. It's regarded as low skill. Uh, it's re it requires a um, very high degree of flexibility. It has very low status, and it has very low pay. Part of the thrust of my book was to think about how that set of circumstances could have arrived historically. And I do still think that we need to understand how the cultural legacy, the historical legacy of how care has been regarded in our culture for many, many centuries is still with us. It still hangs over the sector. And by that, I mean there's a structural marginalisation of care as a worthwhile activity. We have elevated the work ethic and disregarded entirely the care ethic. To quote the American uh, economist Nancy Fulber, she puts it very, very succinctly. She said, patriarchal capitalism was a way of ensuring that care would be available, cheap, or free. It was women's work, and it was either within the family, and therefore it was free, or it was in terms of servant labor, and it was cheap. So long hours and availability have always been written into our understanding of care. Uh, and if you think of the, the, one of the roots of care work, which is in servants, if, and actually this is where there's a very curious kind of amnesia really about the history of care. Uh, the biggest source of employment for women up to the Second World War was as servants. Millions were in servants, uh, working as servants. And that's actually where a large part of care happened. Uh, and of course, that was extremely uh, poorly paid and required immense availability to the point, of course, that servants lived in the house and were expected to be available for the whim of their master or mistress from six o'clock in the morning until late at night. 
The other point, of course, is servants were expected to, to give up the job when they got married. And that really, re I think, indicates how we have always expected carers to be totally available. We have never been prepared to acknowledge that if somebody works in care, there's a very high chance that they have care responsibilities of their own. Uh, and I think that that has become a kind of, uh, a, again, I think it's, it's structural, it's just sort of embedded the understanding that if you're a care worker, you will be able to put in long hours. And a fundamental misunderstanding that by definition, someone who is prepared or willing or wants to do care work is really likely to have care responsibilities of their own. Now, Susie illustrated that point perfectly. She's a very, very warm-hearted woman, and of course she has children, and she has relatives. Her mother also works in care, another remarkably warm-hearted woman, very keen to be a hands-on grandmother, and also very keen to look after her parents. Both of them described how the hours that they worked and the pay that they were paid made it extremely difficult to meet their own care responsibilities. In terms of Susie's mother, that was about the fact that she wasn't paid enough to do the 18-mile round trip to uh, look after, uh, to visit and see her fa her elderly father. In Susie's case, it was hours that were regularly 60 uh, or even 70 hours a week in terms of shifts, which meant that during the holidays, her 12-year-old and her 14-year-old son were often having to look after themselves. So that availability. Uh, I think has been kind of written into the script uh, and, and I would point to another sort of historical root of care uh, which is in the history of nursing and the history of nursing as we know is rooted in the history of nuns. Why are nurses called sisters? It's a legacy from that origins of nursing uh, in um, a, a, a model of Christian self-sacrifice that Florence Nightingale uh, laid out. Now, Florence Nightingale has cast a very, very long shadow over the history of nursing, uh, but I would say over care generally, which is that it is the goodness of women's hearts which is the main motivator in care. That is part of why care has never been paid properly, because it's somehow grubby, you want money, but actually you're doing this out of the goodness of your heart, and you only have to look at care adverts. If you're in any area where there's a disproportionate number of elderly people living, start looking at the care adverts because they all emphasise our care staff go the extra mile. Well, let's just calculate what the extra mile means. It means staying on after the end of your shift. It means doing extra hours when the, you know the, what the care home might be short of staff. It's those kinds of things that are actually being commercialised as part of the sort of sales package of care home companies. So we still expect care work to be subsidised. I'm going to come back to this because I think it's a, it's a, it's, it raises really serious issues which have been described in the past in sociological literature as moral injury. The way in which a kind of structural contradiction is set up in the labour of, of people with, with, I think, very damaging consequences. But before I get to that point, I want to just discuss the issue of low skill, how this is typically regarded as low skill work. In all my experiences of shadowing and observing and interviewing people who worked in jobs that involved an element of care, I could not understand how we have come to see this as low skill work. It is mm. quite, quite astonishing. Now, if you talk to a GP, who has a very, very articulate understanding of care, they will not describe the care element of their job as low skill. On the contrary, they will say it's years of training and knowledge and experience and life experience that enable them to make hundreds of decisions a day in 10-minute appointments. As we know, GPs have an incredible uh, turnover of sort of human dilemmas that they have to sort through rapidly. But to be honest, when I interviewed care workers, I wasn't sure their job was that much different. Again, they have all, all sorts of really complex decisions to make. And uh, at one of the interviews that I did um, uh, with Susie's mother's lodger, <laughs> uh, who's a care worker. Now, he had a very, very interesting background. In his mid-40s, he decided he was uh, fed up with the, with the kind of IT background to retail, and he decided to move into care work. A very big jump, he admitted, uh, but he had absolutely no idea what he was letting himself in for. He said that the 
complexity of his job, the expertise that was required. Frequently, he was the only, um, uh, the only, the, the person leading a shift. He was often the kind of key person that was expected to make medical decisions about whether to draw in another medical professional, such as a paramedic or a nurse or a doctor. And this was in within months of starting in the job. Um, so actually, even in terms of sort of medical skill, many care workers are having to hand out medications and the work is inherently risky. Medication regimes can be complex with several different types of medication um, and they can often be expected to fulfil quite, uh, quite a lot of medical um, uh, procedures such as catheters and so forth. Uh, so just from a medical point of view, it seemed to me that it had a lot of skill. But I, I think even more so, there is a kind of, of skill and expertise which just doesn't get recognised. And, um, and that is, that, that what I would put it, sort of falls into emotional labour. This was the concept um, coined by Arlie Russell Hosschild in 1980 when she was talking in a very, very important study about air stewards. But of course, that concept has now spread into many, many other areas of work. We understand emotional labour. But I'm not sure until you've watched a, a care worker or uh, someone working in care, if you quite appreciate the complexity of the emotional skills required. Take, for example, the way in which I watched a nurse in a GP practice um, working with in a diabetics clinic. Uh, at one level, you could say, well, he was just chatting about holidays. Um, but as he would then reflect afterwards, that chatter about holidays is essential for putting people at their ease, for building trust very rapidly in a situation where there's usually a lot of anxiety. And the care worker has all of those challenges, building trust with someone who may be very, um, very anxious, often uh, may have impairment of memory or um, degenerative diseases such as dementia. Um, so how do you reassure uh, and, um, and calm someone who's, who's anxious? So care workers would talk to me how often they ended up staying on after their shift or staying a long time with someone when they had other uh, priorities in their job to try and calm them down. That it can be extremely difficult to dress someone or feed someone if they're agitated. That actually the emotional task of trust building and relationship building may be essential to those kinds of what get called as basic tasks. The language again and again is so derogatory what's basic. So it seems to me that the, 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 the kind of skill around your presence, about how you appear in a room, how you relate to another person, uh, the way in which you can bring cheerfulness. Gilda was very interesting. Uh, um, she talked about how she had a reputation for always bringing laughter into the care home. She said, that's my nature. I like to have a joke. I like to talk with the staff. I like to talk with the patients ensure that they have a smile on their face by the time I uh, have finished uh, with them and I'm moving on to the next one. Um, and another characteristic I would um, identify, which again I think gets very easily overlooked, is tact. It's a job that involves immense tact because you're having to make all sorts of split-second decisions about the person and the nature of their need, your client, uh, but also all the family relationships that might be around that. So the daughter or the, or the son or the parent or the child, they, they will all have their own anxieties about, is this carer doing a good job? Is this carer attentive to my mother, my father? The depth of those emotional connections that are being touched upon. Um, so that aspect of tact, discretion and judgment, it seemed to me that most care workers have to use very, very finely tuned judgment about what's appropriate, how, when and where. So, as I said, care work requires a particular set of characteristics and they're quite unusual because they're ethical, you have to care about somebody, but they're also pra practical. It's not enough to care about someone, you, you actually have to know how to do something and the practical is absolutely essential in that. And finally, that emotional skill that ability to establish normality. I mean, one of the things I found very interesting is that often people in hospital get very disorientated. Elderly people in hospital, uh, they don't know where they are, they don't know what's happening, they're scared of medical procedures. And so that's, that sense of trying to reassure people, it's Monday, 
your husband's coming in later today. I've, I've seen it in, down in the visitor's book. It's this kind of prompt, particularly around time, actually. That's one of the things can, that can get very, very disorientated. It's Monday morning. It's Tuesday morning. Um, and it's, it's, that, uh, it's, it's those kinds of practical skills. Now, all of that takes experience. It takes building up. It also requires teamwork. It's, a, it's about how people work alongside each other and learn good quality care. You know, it's, it's, it's not something that's just innate, which another is, is another of our terrible misunderstandings that somehow, you know, you just are a good carer or I'm not the sort of person who can do that. Uh, that, that is a kind of, you know, self-limiting uh, perspective. It's very interesting. I interviewed all sorts of people who had found themselves catapulted into situations where they had to provide a lot of care, often in terms of a, a close person, close family relative um, suddenly needing a lot of care. So I think the problem is that the zero hours culture, this culture of availability, you've got to do more shifts, you've got to do more time. That's one of the key issues that comes out. It's because the sector is so overstressed. There's never enough people to do the jobs that are required. So those that are in the sector are under constant pressure to do more work. Um, could you do a fill in another shift? Could you do this? Could you do that? And the problem is, if you're an ethical, if you're, if you have an ethical commitment to caring for others, and you've developed good relationships with your colleagues, you know the consequences of saying no. It means that a client might not be able to go out to a hospital appointment, or uh, a client may not be able to do an activity that they enjoy, and so you find you're constantly under pressure, and that's part of what I would describe as the moral injury. That is why I think care workers um, have uh, uh, such high levels of stress and such high levels of burnout. They all talk about burnout at some point because they're being asked to do things that come into conflict with their own desire to care. So they're being recruited to care and then they find it profoundly difficult to do that in their own personal lives, caring for the people that they love, but also uh, meeting the requirements uh, of uh, an institution where there's not enough staff, and so it's not possible uh, to do it. And another aspect of that moral injury, and, and here I'm coming to the end of my thoughts, is, is around the low status. The number of times in interviews that I had with care workers where they would say, I, I'm ashamed of the work. At, at the school gate, I try and pretend I'm not a care worker. Um, and when I said to them, you know, wh why is that? They said, well, people just think it's wiping bums. I can't explain to them the importance of the work. They don't, they don't see it. Uh, and I think that produces a kind of dissonance because they know the importance of the work and yet they have no public affirmation of the importance of the work from their peers, from their families, from the wider society. Their pay packet is a very concrete example of your work is not important, it's low sk skill. Uh, and I think that, um, that gap between their understanding of the work and the way it's uh, publicly acknowledged is a really, really um, punishing. And, and I'm, I, I link that back to the work of the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, who in his book, which was very influential, The Sources of the Self, he talked about the, the importance of forms of public recognition and affirmation of your identity. And if you are educated and earn a decent salary, you've never had to think about that because actually most of the time you're getting lots of affirmation uh, and you know how to ensure that you do. Uh, and um, I think that it takes a real imaginative leap to think, well, what's it like if... I, if my job is, it is actually a source of shame, that people think, look down upon me for my work. Um, and I, I end up actually sort of mumbling or saying, childcare worker seems to actually be less stigmatised. Um, uh, so I think that um, that compounds a set of problems. And then, particularly with, with Gilda, the interviewee, um, she had an enormously strong sense of self-respect. And what had made her job toxic was the lack of recognition within the organisation of her own sense of dignity uh, and, and self-respect. And that, I think, is where the sector has come under immense commercial pressures in the last 
two decades. So as one person said to me, the managers now wear high heels. They don't work alongside us. Uh, and they are under pressure to increase productivity. Uh, and the relationships, I think, have become uh, very, very often very, very challenging. Because the role of the manager, and in a way this is one of the most important points alongside, of course, the long hours and low pay, but the role of the manager in the care home is crucial. If there's a good manager, you have good care, and you have a culture of care, and you have people who find their work um, at least bearable. Uh, when you have poor management, and I think there has been a real problem with poor management in care homes, uh, I think things unravel really fast. Because the thing about care is it's teamwork, and I think this has been a real misunderstanding. We think that it's about heroic individuals who are so good-natured and good-hearted, uh, but it's not. Good care work, good care comes from teams who are supporting each other, who are caring for each other, and that's why I talk about cultures of care. So um, I'm delighted that the Roundtree Foundation uh, decided to, to focus on this particular sector because I think it has so many problems that have gone so far under the public radar um, that I think um, it's terrific if we can help raise them. Thank you um, very much indeed, Madeline. Um, so many powerful points there. I think we've just been joined, I can't quite see who they're like, it's Susie at the... At Hi, the Susie! <laughs> and in, in, <laughs> if, if, if just I'll, I'll just read out a line or two and then just I wonder if, if you might just say a word about what you thought reading Madeline's piece if she if you thought she'd missed anything that was important to you but just while you gather your thoughts I mean two things jumped out um, at me first of all I think it's good to make this graphic some of the things um, Madeline's talking about there in a kind of moral vocabulary um, but like, what does this mean at the concrete level, which is what Madeline's piece actually does. Here's one sentence, not about Susie, but about uh, Gilda. On one occasion, she was expected to step in at short notice and cook for 50 people. That's something I certainly wouldn't have the skills to do, but um, because no chef had turned up. But rather than any appreciation, the management hauled her in to complain about graffiti on a notice board and threatened her with the sack. Um, so that kind of mismatch of, you know, someone who's prepared to go all the way uh, for their employer and for the people that they're working for, an absolute contempt um, in return is pretty stunning. And the other thing, the slightly more theoretical point with it being a Roundtree event, just thinking in terms of researchers, is I know that in quite a lot of, you know, in economics, there's a thing called the marginal productivity theory of the wage. In other words, what you produce is the thing that you get paid. But I know that in a lot of the research, what happens is that you look at what someone earns and you say, oh, they're a high skill worker because they earn a lot. You know, we say that we're bringing in for immigration policy, you need to earn £35,000 or more in order to come in, or whatever the threshold is, and count as a high skilled um, worker. But it's no longer a theory if you're doing that. It's a tautology. We're saying you earn a lot, so you must be skilled and you're skilled. You know, it goes round and round in a circle. And uh, people doing incredibly important work like this um, uh, are locked out of that circle. But Susie, would you mind just in a sentence or two or, or more, if you like, just telling us what you thought on, on reading Madeline's piece? Thank you. Um, you okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was strange to read it because obviously it was reading my own words back. And I think sometimes when you look back, like I've changed my job recently, but at the time, I was working so much, I was just running on adrenaline. And it wasn't until I finished and had some time off that I really realised how much of myself I was putting into my work. Um, my assistant manager rang me one day, and I was like, oh, it's Janine ringing me. And my younger son straight away said, please don't pick up any more shifts, mum. And I thought, I've really got the balance wrong here at the moment. So... Yeah, the article really did sum up what it's like, and I've had people message me and say, oh, you were bang on in what you were saying. You've ruffled a few feathers, but I've left, so it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was really good. So thank you for listening to like what we had to say, because I don't think many people have got an idea. It's like you said, they think it's just, oh, you're just wiping bums, but you're supporting with everything, you know, and through like the pandemic as well there's so much more emotional support we've had to give and help with you know, mental health issues we might have never seen in these people before. And you're not given any training. 
It's just like, this is what's happening now, so deal with it. And if it goes wrong, we'll let you know. But if it goes right, we're not going to say anything to praise you for it. But, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that Pat? Is that Pat? Yes. 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 Well, maybe Pat's got... Pat. I Pat's also, also interviewed in the, Pat. Yeah. In the story. Yeah. I was trying to be the quiet one in the corner there. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm Susie's mum, by the way, and I'm amazingly proud of her. Um, so I know she hates me because I shared the article around Facebook and <laughs> yeah, she wasn't happy. Um, but Susie's been doing this job a long time and I started doing it six years ago. And I think up until I actually walked in and started doing the job, I had no appreciation of what my daughter was doing on a daily basis. And at the time I was doing child protection, which brings its own joys. Um, uh, which was highly stressful and all the rest of it. Being a care worker is so much harder. It really is. Now I appreciate why she was exhausted, why she'd come home after a 24-hour shift and then have to look after the kids. And I will also bring up, she's also a single parent, so she's got two boys who are amazing. Um, it was really good that I think now, for the first time, people are listening to care workers and actually listening to what we go through and what we do. I, I'm a care worker, but I've got it quite easy at the moment. I only do a couple of night shifts a week because I'm a branch secretary in a union. But through that, I'm supporting 500 employers in the charity sector who are mainly care workers. So I hear what's going on in my workplace. I experience what's going on in my workplace. But I've also got them on the phone to me. And the big thing is the total lack of respect. And that's not only from the general public. It does reflect in our wages. You know, 8.91 an hour. We don't get the real living wage. We don't mm. get it. It's just not going to happen. Um, so 8.91 an hour, that tells you what we're worth. People do, I will admit, when Madeline said that, you know, the shame of it. I am really proud of being a care worker. But when I'm in certain company, and I will emphasize the fact I'm a branch secretary, I won't emphasize the fact I'm a support worker because in certain company I know that people are going to respect and listen to me if I tell them what I do with the union. If I tell them I'm a care worker, they're not going to care what I say because they don't respect us. It is changing. COVID has certainly brought us to the front. People are seeing a lot more, but there's a lot further to go yet. Um, and I mean, with the latest sort of budgeting and stuff, it's all going to the NHS, and people phone me up all the time going, why is it all going there? They're on £11.50 an hour, I'm on 8 91 who cares about me? So I, I'd like to say thank you, Madeline. The, I thought the report was excellent. Susie wasn't so impressed, because I shared it. It was the photos. <laughs> she doesn't, she doesn't, and she never will about that, and I think that is the thing we care about, because they won't blow their own trumpet, and they will gloss over what happens to them. And we do. I, I took part in a thing recently and I read out an account of a shift. And it wasn't even a bad shift. And I read it out and people were crying at the end because it starts with, I got punched in the face tonight. And that's normal and we are expected to deal with it. And there is no, there is no talking about it afterwards. And it's always our fault when it happens. Well, sometimes you can't get out of the way fast enough. That's, you know, that's what it is. So I think anything that brings care workers and the difficulties that they face and the amazing job they do and the amazing people that they are. I say, I, I worked in child protection. I worked with people who earned thousands upon thousands of money. I now work with people who earn twelve to £14,000 a year and they are the best group of people I have ever worked with. So thank you all for listening and thank you, Madeline, for writing it. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And I love the pictures of Susie as well, but she didn't, so. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Pat. Um, uh, I'm going to bring in now um, Hazel, um, who, as I say, has been working latterly um, on the policy stuff with GRF. We'll hear about how that works, but has also um, uh, for a long time worked in the care sector herself. And me and Katie, I know, are kind of keen to come on and talk about the... Um, other um, sectors of the economy, and I'll show some statistics about how it's not just care. Um, but um, Hazel, just like in a sentence, you know, did, did, did you um, 
how do you react to um, what you've heard so far and then and then whatever else you want to say? I, I could totally relate to everything that Madeline and Susie said um, as I cared myself for um, a number of years. I could totally relate to, to everything and I agree with everything I've said. And then go straight into you had other things to say? Okay. So I'm Hazel, I'm from a small rural ex mining village in Fife up in sunny Scotland. I've got two sons who are now 20 and 18. The 20 year old's moved out, got his own house, but he works in Shetland three weeks out of four. The younger one is still at home, unsure what to do now eh, since school and college is finished. I was a single parent most of their life, but I met someone five years ago whom I'm engaged to now, and we've got a stepdaughter, she's 12. I've been out of work for the past couple of years due to ill health, but I've recently secured a job as a sales support executive in a water company, which is totally brand new to me, as my previous jobs, like I said, were in support work and care. Mostly care within nursing homes and out in the community, supporting individuals to live independently at home. I got involved with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, as I'm quite passionate about raising awareness of poverty in the UK and the real suffering that goes on behind closed doors for many families. I felt like I was given an opportunity to be a voice for those families and tell the stories of their struggles and hardships within day-to-day life. This was especially important in this project as GRF and Involve were allowing people like me who have experience of poverty to be included in the shaping of the project right from the start. GRF believed that in order to design effective solutions that met real-world needs, people with experience of those issues should have a say in what the problem is and be equal partners in finding the solutions. We were involved in every single part of the project and I truly feel our views were valued at every step of the way. Those of us with lived experience were always given the opportunity to talk. We were always asked for our thoughts and opinions and if we missed a session, it was always followed up by a phone call to make sure that all of our thoughts were included. Decisions were always made by the whole group. GRF, Involve, never took charge and made decisions based on their knowledge. We were always consulted on our thoughts and ideas. It was emotional at times and difficult to hear stories of other people's issues and struggles that they faced, but it was true, it was real life. We knew that for every story we told, there were hundreds of other people in the same situation. Unfortunately, they just didn't have the same platform as we did to tell their story, so we are trying to tell it for them. This is new to GRF and it was an exciting, innovative way of working which we hoped would bring fresh new results from the research and new ideas for recommendations for change. My experience of insecure work comes from within the care sector, mainly care at home or care in the community. I was drawn into care, and Madeline might not like this, but I was drawn into care as I didn't have any previous experience or skills or knowledge. At the interview, I was led to believe it would be flexible work and it would work around my commitments with my two sons. This worked for the first week or so, and then it changed. You got your rota on a Friday. On a, you got your rota on a Friday afternoon for the following week. This left no room for negotiating shifts. This made arranging appointments, childcare, and social activities near impossible. I missed so much of my kids' school events, sports days, Christmas plays etc and I felt like a terrible mother and it made me wonder sometimes if it was even worthwhile. In fact that rota that we got on a Friday was only worth the paper it was printed on as the rotas changed daily, in fact sometimes hourly. We never really knew where we would end up and what time we would finish our shifts. This made it difficult to plan for anything and I missed so much appointments and social events. We were phoned and told not to visit clients because they were in hospital, had family visit in, or had maybe passed away, but then told to pick up other clients because they were short-staffed or another team were held up. It was difficult to refuse because we knew if we didn't that that client would not receive their care. We often had a relationship with the clients and their families, so we really didn't want to let them down or let them go without that essential care. We were never paid for the ones we didn't attend, so t- sometimes we could have an hour's gap between visits and we just sat in the car until it was time to go to the next, but we were never paid for that hour. The trouble with this means no, ri- no reliability, no idea of the numbers of hours you will work from week to week, and in turn, no idea what wage you will get at the end of the month. 
This resulted in me building up lots of debts. Lots of payments were cut to bills to leave enough to live on most months, especially if the boys at six foot odds each needed new clothes or shoes. Mm. Due to the fluctuation in the wages each month, my housing benefit entitlements changed from month to month and some months I would be left to cover that overhang, but I could never manage it. This caused me to rack up rent arrears and I would always get letters and visits from the landlords, which caused stress and anxiety. Going from being dependent on benefits was supposed to be a step up. Everyone said you're better off working and even though I may have been a few pounds better off each week, it was not always. At least with benefits you can rely on them. You knew how much you were getting and when. This wasn't the case with this work. Very rarely did we have any money left over for a treat. I thought when I was working and rarely seeing the kids that when we did see each other we could do something special. But no, we still couldn't afford that. We still didn't have any money left over to save for holidays. We still struggled to buy the boys the essentials, such as clothes and shoes. We hoped, I hoped that when working I would be able to afford to meet up with friends for coffee or lunch, but no. I still had to keep declining, I still had to keep declining invites to the point they stopped asking. Getting a job and working was supposed to be better than relying solely on benefits, but for me, I was worse off working, not just, work, not just financially, but emotionally as well. Working caused lots of stress and anxiety, which had a severe impact on my mental health, which then impacted on my physical health, to the point I had to quit, and I was not fit enough to go back to work until recently. I've been invited to speak at numerous events, telling my story of poverty and being a voice for those thousands of parents, just like myself. I'm not looking for sympathy or expecting handouts from doing this. I just want people who have no idea what it's like to live in poverty to hear exactly how it is. Families and children may look well dressed and present well, but that doesn't mean they're not f they, that doesn't mean they have money and they're not fighting a daily battle. No one knows what goes on behind that closed door to ensure the kids are fed and kept well, and I want that to change. I want people to know how difficult it is for those families living in poverty every single day. I want to be their voice and tell their stories, or for my, my example, to give them strength and confidence to step forward and allow their own voices to be heard. I do not feel there is one quick fix for this. I feel everyone needs to come together to create a more realistic, culture that reflects the world that we live in today. I feel the support and benefit programmes in place are just not compatible with society in which we live. Long gone are the days when mum stays at home to be the dutiful housewife and take care of the 2.4 children and dad works 9 to 5 to bring home the bacon. This simply is not the case. In order to break the poverty cycle and get working families out of the poverty trap, the infrastructures that are put in place must adapt to reflect the people and families they are supposed to be helping in the first place. Their support networks, benefit systems, rates of play, pay and flexible working are like square pegs and they're not just not integrating with the round poverty holes that today's working families currently live in. So what can change? The availability of jobs with a flexible attitude to hours and shifts to allow for one or two parent families Zero hour contracts need to be abolished and replaced with minimum hour contracts so employees know that no matter what they will, no matter what, they will at least receive a minimum amount, amount each week. Adequate notice of shifts need to be compulsory and compensation for late notice of cancelled shifts or even clients in the case of casework. A reasonable rate of pay, i.e. the living wage with a top up benefit for those who need it. The living wage and the benefits need to increase yearly to match the rate of inflation and match the minimum amount families need to live on, not just to survive. This would require them to have enough for basics and some left over for those treats and luxuries that we never had. Childcare needs to be more available. We need to think out of this nine to five box and have childcare to fit around the family demand rather than families trying to fit around the childcare. Transport childcare and fuel prices need to be capped at a reasonable price to prevent agencies from charging over the odds to families and 
taking more and more advantage of the vulnerable. Oh, was <laughs> I feel if everything works in sync, it will work for the better. More families work in and being able to spend money and time with their families for clothes, foods and leisure activities. This would have such a positive impact on all areas of family life as well as the society and the economy as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel, very much <laughs> um, indeed. And I could hear, like, um, uh, I'm sure we'll hear some of that repeated with Katie because I can see that the two of you have been working together on the, on, on, on the detailed ideas there about compensation for lost shifts and all the rest of it. Um, because we brought in um, Susie and Pat, I think we might just r run a little bit longer for till 10 past or so. Um, and Katie, if it's all right with you, because we've heard so much now about care, I was just going to put up a couple of slides from the report so to help get the message that it's not just about care just and, and, and then get you to talk after that. Is that all right with you? Yeah. Right, so these are um, they're in the um, report on... Um, pages uh, 12 um, and 13, but just um, to show you a few um, highlights um, about things, or lowlights, about um, some of the things Hazel's saying there, in particular the way that it's not the, just the low pay, it's the variability of the pay, the in, um, insecurity of the pay, and the way that that bangs up against things like rent that have to be paid and don't vary in the same Way. So let's just have a look at some of the ways that that happens across the economy. Here's um, uh, four different types uh, of um, uh, insecure contractual arrangements, just one way we can measure it. Uh, across the economy, uh, nearly 300,000 casual or seasonal workers, 600,000 people working through agencies, other people in different forms of temps, and then Biggest of all these days, this uh, phrase, zero hours contract, 800,000. So you add that together, you can see you're in the, in the in maybe a couple of million um, uh, workers, which when you think, you know, lots of these workers will have kids, it's even more people who are affected by that. So um, it's a, a significant uh, issue can, um, just in numbers terms across the economy. What bits of the economy is it? Um, well, it's sort of, um, to a greater or lesser extent, like an awful lot of the economy. Health and social care work, we can see there um, about 9% of the people who work in that sector are uh, affected. That's the one we've highlighted. If we chose in hospitality, it would be even more people. It would be 16%. And then also some sectors that maybe we don't think of so much, like education or um, arts and entertainment, a very another high one. And even in something like manufacturing, where the cliche would be that's where you have the good jobs still, you know, it's still um, more than one worker in every 20 there, which will mean very much more than one in 20 in some individual factories, I'm sure. And then the final thing I wanted to highlight is, um, uh, like, who is this affecting? Because you get this this comes up, doesn't it, on the news sometimes people say, oh, you know, zero hour contracts work very well for IT contractors who like to go to Goa for six months of the year. And then, they, you know, y y there's always a kind of like, let's not um, like close these things down because they're useful for some people who can earn a large amount of money quite quickly. But what this says is if we take um, the people we can see in the surveys who are on these insecure forms of working, where in the income distribution are they? And what we find is that people are both poor and precarious at once. So, you know, you're going down at a point where you're already quite close to the waterline. Um, you can see that most clearly there with um, the last two. Um, I mean, there are, you know, high skilled people, um, high skilled in inverted commas or high paid people doing agency work. But if we look at, say, zero hour contracts, um, uh, of all the people across the economy who are on zero hour contracts, 57% of them are found in the bottom fifth, the bottom of the earnings bracket, and only 3% of them are in the top earnings bracket. So the two things um, come absolutely together. So thanks to Rebecca McDonald of GRF for all those useful um, numbers. They're in the report if you want to look at them at leisure. Another thing, the only other thing I'm going to highlight from the report towards the back there, page 18, I think it is, is just what 
there are solutions out there. Katie's going to talk about some of them. And one of the reasons we're confident there's solutions is because um, in other places from Ireland to um, Oregon in the US, um, different countries are trying different fixes to do something about it. But um, Katie, uh, over to you now um, about what we need to do about it all. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's very tough. Thank you so much, Hazel. Um, and I think, you know, I think Hazel's contribution tonight really sort of um, illustrates so, so well why this way of working is important to JRF. Um, we, we set out on this project wanting to share a bit of the power that we have as an organisation to, um, you know, just we're spending a lot of time thinking about what are the problems that are important for poverty, what are the solutions that we need to try and convince people to implement in order to do something about poverty. But actually, this project for us was a really important departure in trying to do that together with people who are at the sharp end and things that we were talking about. So throughout this whole project, we had a core of um, what we called co-designers, so Hazel and uh, a number of other people who all had experience of different forms of poor quality work, and then people from within JRF who were, um, who were sort of experts in policy or analysis or campaigns and communication. And um, I'm not sure why not. It wasn't this at all. There we go. <laughs> um, so I just I was just talking a little bit there. Hopefully you could. Can you hear that at the back? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah it's good. good. That's good. I'll go back over it then. Um, but yeah, so we're um, we. I think, you know, Hazel's observation that the world of work that we are sort of talking about here is kind of designed for a different century, a century where you had a sort of you know, single breadwinner family and uh, you know, the contribution that Madeline's made as well in talking about the sort of origins of how we think about the care sector and think about care as an area of work. I mean, that to me just demonstrates the importance of, you know, what, why it matters to have those different perspectives all coming together around a piece of work. Um, and, you know, we hear and you know, this is not a criticism of Madeline's piece in any way, but you know, we often hear people's experience of, um, of struggling. You know, people appear in work as case studies. They appear in work as to sort of demonstrate the problems that we know are out there that we know need to be tackled and to try and motivate people to do something about it. That's really important. But what we wanted to do here is, you know, Hazel said she's been invited time and time again to talk about her experience to recount her experiences to audiences of people to help them to understand what's happening. This project tried to go beyond that and actually work with people on what the solutions should be. So people go from being a sort of example of a problem to actually being active agents to help to drive change. Um, and so we hope through this work that we've made some contribution to uh, trying out a way of doing that. We learned loads along the way. It didn't all go smoothly and yeah, there was a pandemic in the middle of it as well which didn't help at all um, and we've just put out a report today that sets out some of what we learnt along the way in terms of how to do this kind of work and um, but also to set out the um, what we found through this piece of work and as Tom says you know care is such a powerful and important example but it's by no means the only example this is not a problem of the care sector this is a problem across lots of different parts of our economy and uh, that first statistic that you, well, second one actually that you had up that sort of showed the, um, you know, all the different parts of the economy that have very insecure contract types. We also did another piece of work, uh, analytical work, which looked at um, how people's hours and their pay varies week to week. And again, you just get the same, because you know, that matters actually, because if you're on a sort of low hours contract, but actually you typically work loads more, you know, you're on a four hours contract, in the retail sector, but typically you actually work 20 hours a week. You know, that's a pretty common thing to happen. So actually the number of hours that people work week to week, even when they've got a seemingly more secure contract can still vary really widely and still has a, obviously a huge impact on your income if you're paid on an hourly basis. Um, and you know, that analysis shows 2.8 million people have their hours varying week to week and two thirds of them, their pay varies as well. And they are predominantly low paid they are in very much the same sectors as the analysis of insecure contracts. So I think it's just to make the point that there is uh, a slightly, there is, yeah, the, the insecure contract 
way of looking at it is important, but actually there is a sort of bigger problem here, even when you seemingly, on the face of it, have a more secure type of contract. And I think, you know, Hazel's experience of um, sort of being offered flexibility that actually in, um, you know, when it comes to it doesn't really exist in practice, or certainly not on the not a form of flexibility that works for you as the employee is something that we heard from a lot of people in working in different sectors actually as part of this work and um, but just to sort of pick up a couple of other examples of kind of how this stuff manifests itself in people's lives and why it really matters is you know we one of our co-designers who worked in the warehousing sector for a long time would describe how he would um you know go into a shift for a night shift on a you know, industrial estate, pretty much in the middle of nowhere, be getting the last bus there, and then there's no public transport after that. And it would be a regular occurrence for him to turn up at work, only for his shift to be cancelled as he arrived, or curtailed after an hour or two. And he either then had the choice of spending an hour or so walking home in the middle of the night, waiting till five o'clock in the morning for the buses to start, or paying for a taxi which would wipe out most of what he'd just earned. And it's not like it was a one-off. It would happen a lot. Uh, and I think what, you know, what it shows is that you know, a good job, and we talked a lot about what it means to have a good job, uh, it's about treating people with dignity. It's about treating people like human beings. It's about understanding that people have lives outside of work. And it's about stability and providing a foundation from which you can actually build a family life and you, know, you can't plan if you don't know what your shifts are going to be, what your earnings are going to be from one week to the next. It makes family life so much harder, it makes it impossible sometimes. And you know, the same with um, <coughs> flexibility and the ability to access flexibility that actually works for you and your family life and potentially your health needs as well. Um, you know, if your employer doesn't recognise that you have those, you, know, you have a life outside of work, then again, it just makes it so much harder. And I think, you know, thinking about what came through this work much more powerfully and perhaps much more strongly than it would have done had it just been a, a JRF project done in the usual way, is this issue of dignity is absolutely at the forefront of uh, what we do and sort of being treated as a human being and not just as a cog in the machine. But as well, it's about the way in which insecurity bleeds into other areas of your life, how stressful it is when you don't know what your, uh, what your hours and your income is going to be. And it's also about the sense of powerlessness that a lot of people feel in the workplace. So while on the face of it, having the right to request this, that and the other, whether it's a right to request flexible working or a right to request um, a, a contract that reflects your actual working hours, something that's being debated at the moment. Um, you know, on the face of it, a right to request sounds quite good, but actually, if the person you're requesting that from ultimately has sway over whether you're going to get any shifts next week, that's, that's not an equal starting point for that negotiation and for that conversation. And I think that that part of our conversation in particular led us to really lean into the idea of rights to have, actual employment rights rather than just rights to request. So in terms of what can be done, I mean, there's loads of stuff that can be done. There's loads of stuff that lo lots of employers already do. So we, you know, we've seen some great examples of um, you know, organisations, you know, things like the Living Hours, that uh, the Living Wage Foundation heads up, which is about trying to provide security to workers. There is a sort of growing movement now of employers signing up to that. There are examples of um, you know, firms that are starting to actually go back to those that work for them on zero hours contracts and say to them, actually, is this a form of contract that works for you or would you rather convert it into a contract that reflects the minimum hours that you typically work for us? Um, there are firms that are thinking about how they can um, train up their staff to make them so they're more flexible and can work in more different roles within the organisation. So if one area of work is no longer needed, instead of cancelling that shift, you can redeploy that worker so they're still doing something productive. Um, so there's loads of stuff that can be done voluntarily, but actually we really wanted to focus in on some tangible things that could be delivered quite quickly as part of this project. And so the employment bill that the government has promised was a really important opportunity there. And 
you know, together we put together a set of asks that are around notice of shifts, compensation for shifts that are cancelled at late notice, a right to a secure contract that reflects your actual working hours, flexibility, a right to flexibility from day one, and all backed by rigorous enforcement because otherwise those rights are not worth the paper that they're written on. And I think, you know, there are really strong arguments, we would say, for why this should happen. Like, there are good economic arguments to make. Um, you know, with one in eight workers in poverty in this country, the employers can't really expect to get the best out of those people if they're stressed out about sort of making ends meet and keeping a roof over their heads. Um, but also, I think, you know, with Tom, you mentioned productivity in the economy, I think. And, um, you know, there is, that is ultimately the path to sustainably better jobs. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that our reliance on insecure work is actually part of our productivity problem. Because if you've got someone who is not a member of staff that you expect to stay around for long, you've got really high turnover, you've got a lot of temporary staff, you're not going to invest in those staff. Um, and actually that sort of perpetuates an element mm. of that problem. And I think, you know, ultimately, as we come out of the pandemic, as the economy recovers, we have to think about the kind of recovery that we want to see. And for us, that means putting a floor on what the standards should be that everyone should be able to expect. And that's part of the reason why we've called for the government to sort of bring forward its employment bill now, so that, or at least um, to sort of signal that that's what's coming, because they didn't announce it in this year's Queen's speech, but obviously, hopefully, it will be in next year's. But we need to be starting to have that debate now so that it signals a clear intent about what kind of recovery we're going to have or we want to have. And also, importantly, gives businesses time to adjust as well for any changes that are coming down the track and to get right the sort of support and guidance that might be needed to go alongside any new employment rights. I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much um, indeed. I mean, it's fascinating how some of the, some of the argument you're making there is articulated by... Boris Johnson, you know, in terms of like, you know, the old model of low wage, low investment in workers, low skills, that's got to, that's got to change. It's good and interesting that with his new coalition vote as he's talking about it. And yet, like we have uh, a kind of approach from the government that to me seems to be um, embodied in the or symbolised by the fact that they promise an employment bill and then it kind of goes missing. Mm. Um, and then, um, you know, they're talking about right to request. But as you say, what good is a request if you can't? follow through in it you know the devil is in the detail at the moment or maybe the devil is in the absence of detail from um the government on all of this but they're making the right noises and so like there should be an opportunity uh to push to get them to um sign up on the detail that develops what they're saying um in a minute i'm going to propose that we go upstairs and we can continue the conversation um with a glass of wine in our hand and um we're hoping we'll be joined by Angela Rayner, um, who uh, is someone else who's got um, first-hand experience of um, care herself. Um, but people have spoken for a bit longer. I found it absolutely fascinating, but just want to check before saying that we're finished. Is anyone like desperate to ask a question? I could take one or at most two, I think, because otherwise we're just uh, playing games with the timetable and we can chat more upstairs. But if there's one or two questions that people are dying to ask, shout now or alternatively, we can do them upstairs. Well, I think the speakers have aced it, haven't they? <laughs> um, uh, like I say, let's let's um, let's let's pause then. Um, and like, it really is a, a we've got a good forty-five minutes to um, chat about things because I'm sure you've all got thoughts and uh, reactions um, uh, to it. But thanks um, very much for coming out um, to talk about this. Um, I mean, this is a cross-party report, I should say. Um, lots of MPs, um, including on the Conservative side, were um, keen to come. Um, a couple have been knocked out by COVID. Um, Greg Clark, you'll see the former Trade Secretary, is in the report and wrote an article um, on much of this territory. So it's good to see that it's not a party um, political issue. Thanks very much to Susie and Pat for coming along, as well as, of course, to Madeline for writing that magisterial piece and now talking about it so eloquently, to Hazel for making that crucial link between the experience and what we need to do about it, and for Katie um, to, for um, uh, distilling it all 
so eloquently. But um, I think we should leave it there because we can continue chatting upstairs. Thanks very much. <laughs>